Andrew Leung. He's a business consultant and former government official in Hong Kong. Andrew, what's this about? This is a pretty wide-ranging threat. Is this over the recent war of words because of the spy balloon allegations and the COVID-19 flap? It's much deep-seated than that, uh, because for the first time, um, when um, before China was brought into the uh, world order dominated by the United States, for example, you helped to get into the World Trade Organization. But now uh, China seemed to be eating Americans' lunch uh, on high technology uh, and also exerting its influence um, and then um, sort of narrowing the scope uh, for American hegemony, um, in, for example, in the South China Sea and other uh, relations with other countries. So um, the United States across the aisle, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, uh, both agree on one thing, and that's the China, so-called China threat. And so they're pushing back uh, against China 360 degrees, technology, uh, diplomacy, um, and military South China Sea uh, alliances, um, um, and also um, using sanctions, long arm sanctions. So it's, a, it's, it's regarded as an existential threat. Uh, and they are doubling down um, uh, on, on it, um, even trying to provoke uh, China on Taiwan, for example. Um, and then as if uh, doing more of the same uh, will achieve their objective. But the world order has been now changing fast uh, with the developing world, including China, India, and, and countries in the Middle East and in, in, even in Africa and Latin America. Uh, according to the OECD, uh, the developing world economy combined uh, is going to exceed that um, of the rest of the world um, you know, accounting for something like 60 percent by the year 2035 using uh, purchasing power parity measurements. And according to Goldman Sachs, a recent research by the year 2075, um, the top eight countries in the world, uh, by which time the United States would descend into number three uh, after China and in India um, in terms of GDP. Uh, but the rest of the top eight countries are mm. all developing nations now. You know, so it's, the world order is uh, Andrew, uh, it's interesting that these officials were using the word suppressive in talking about U.S. policy. Well, the U.S. uses that word to describe China's policies often towards its own people, as well as minority groups inside the country, any form of dissent. So when they say that U.S. policy towards China is suppressive, what policies are they talking about? And if, as you say, China is, I think you said, eating the U.S.'s lunch, why would it use a word like suppression? Well, of course, there's a lot of rhetoric uh, and trying to blacken China uh, on Hong Kong, on Xinjiang, uh, and and um, uh, painting China, uh, the Communist Party, as if it's an evil regime, um, without regard to the recent Harvard Kennedy School study, which out, out about a couple of months ago. And they look around the world to see to what extent the people support their government. Um, and they found that the, the Chinese people um, has the highest the, uh, the Communist Party has the highest support in the world, multiple ranks above, uh, ahead of the United States, because the lives of the vast majority of Chinese people have been totally transformed for the better uh, during the past 40 years under the tutelage of the Communist Party. And then even though there are red lines, but then if you go to China, you can see that you know, what kind of life and 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 what kind of freedoms people en would enjoy. And then this is illustrated by the fact that over 120 million uh, Chinese are traveling around the world, and where and no one um, has chosen not to return to China. So if it is a China such a repressive regime, so why why is this happening? So I think that this is a, a lot of false rhetoric in trying to blacken China and trying to confront China because China seems to be an existential threat now to the United States hegemony without regard um, to the, to the also fact Andrew, that the world is turning yeah, during, to Poland. During the same meeting, we also heard Chinese officials align themselves once again with Russia. And of course, right before Russia invaded Ukraine a year ago, we heard this rhetoric of no limits relationship, a new era for the relationship between China and Russia. Why does China want to continue to align itself with this, some would call it a disaster that Russia is creating in its war with Ukraine? 
Well, the relationship between China and, and Russia um, dates back well, well before the uh, Ukraine war, because the two economies are extremely complementary. Now, Russia has been the world's largest, uh, one of the world's largest exporter of energy and agricultural products, whereas China has always been the world's la largest customer. So the two um, economies are, are, are actually intertwined well before uh, the Ukraine war. And this relationship is likely to continue and, in fact, intensify because both China and Russia are painted into a corner uh, and regarded as the arch enemy by the United States hegemon. All right, Andrew, good to talk to you. Thanks very much. You're welcome.